Welcome back friends and family, I'm Codiferous and today I'm bringing you the video that no one asked for, but the video that you know you deserved. That's right, welcome to Castle Crashers All Bosses Ranked. You guys know the drill by now, before we start this list off I need to go over a few things. Firstly, I've beaten Castle Crashers over 40 times, so I'm something of a big deal when it comes to this thing not trying to brag. For the gameplay that you're about to be showcased, I chose the Red Knight and worked on maxing the magic stat first. I chose this specifically because according to online polls, the Red Knight is the most popular starting knight and Magic is the most popular stat. This list is also directed at those playing through Castle Crashers for the very first time. As always, the following list is comprised wholly of my own personal opinion and is not meant to be taken as unshakable fact. It's also worth mentioning that this list is aimed at normal mode and not insane mode. This is because I don't have the patience or time to record an entire playthrough on insane mode. For reference, it took me about 2 hours to gather all the footage for normal, whereas it would take days of failure and tedium to bring you the same footage for insane mode. You other Castle Crashers veterans know exactly what I'm talking about. Even still, I will argue that the boss ranking remains nigh unchanged between the two difficulties. One final thing, this boss rank video will not be as intense and in-depth as my other videos such as Ninja Gaiden Black All Bosses Ranked, but that's because Castle Crashers is a very simplistic game in comparison, and there isn't as much strategy and complexity to analyze. Now enough delay, let's jump into things. Number 21, The Alien Ship. Encountered at the end of the first desert level segment, the alien ship is not much stronger than the alien enemies it spawns. The alien ship only has one method of attack in which it will vanish off screen for a few before returning to drop a stone slab on your head for a minute amount of damage. The hardest part of the whole fight is just trying to consistently hit the damn thing. Use the launcher maneuver to try to get an air combo going and this thing should go down rather quickly. If you're heavily magic invested like I am, use your rocket jump and spam your aerial magic attack instead. Watch out though, you'll have to fight a second alien ship directly after this one. Repeat the process over again and you're well on your way to your first medieval probe session. Number 20, The War Machine. I have to give it to Behemoth, they do a pretty good job of scaling the difficulty of bosses in this game. Contrary to Ninja Gaiden, the first boss is one of the very easiest. The War Machine rolls back and forth while occasionally shooting its cannons. It will eventually become stationary where the barbarians inside will crank up to reveal themselves before dispensing a foot soldier to annoy you. This is when the War Machine is most vulnerable. Combo to your heart's content while dodging back every few strikes to avoid a cannonball. The War Machine will also roll across the stage where it has a chance of running you over for negligible damage, so do your best to not play in traffic. Nothing else to really talk about here. It's the first boss. What'd you expect? Number 19, The Barbarian King. The first fight that feels like a boss fight. This comes in the form of The Barbarian King. He has three primary forms of attack. The first is a small punch that has decent knockback. This attack has a small wind up to it, so take that as a sign to back off to avoid taking damage. He'll switch it up and use the giant mattress on his back to slam you into the ground. It's important to note that while you are planted, you essentially have invincibility. Time yourself when you decide to come out of the ground so you don't get caught by a follow up attack. When the Barbarian King reaches his half life, he'll start chugging some illegal substances, which cause him to belch fire, knocking himself across the arena. This attack also has a decently large animation, so take that as a sign to get out of the way. After each attack, the Barbarian King has a solid window for you to punish him. Air combos, as always, are the best ways to maximize your damage against him, and any other boss really. Throughout the fight, he'll spawn more and more Barbarian Soldiers. Don't focus on them too much as they will continually replace one another. Just finish the Barbarian King off and collect your riches and bitches. Number 18, the Ship Monster, aka the Troll Mother. Now I know what you're thinking, Codiferous, why do you call it the Ship Monster? Well let's see, you encounter this boss at the end of the Ship Forest, you know, the location where the rumblings of the Shitlord cause all the wildlife to evacuate their large intestines uncontrollably. In addition to shedding off many shitlings to do its bidding, there's no other befitting name for this thing. The Ship Monster doesn't have any attacks of its own, rather it spawns a horde of shitlings to do all the dirty work. 
This boss is relatively tanky this early in the game and is insanely tanky on insane mode, no surprise there. This fight is a war of attrition, and while it is a great place to farm experience, if you're inefficient at calling all the shitlings, you run the risk of being overran. That aside, if you focus on the boss itself, you shouldn't have too much trouble here. Beating the boss triggers a chase scene where you need to escape the shit lord, but don't worry about that, we'll get to him later. As a side note, the shit monster was encountered a second time during the marsh, but you were much more powerful here, so it poses zero threat. Number 17, Volcano. Number 17 finds its way as a sentient volcano with the grudge against knights. The only way to damage this boss is to eat a sandwich and lay a smackdown. You can get sandwiches at the volcano store, or you can farm them at the iron door location earlier in the level by killing the infinite spawning fire demon. This boss only has one form of attack and summons two fire demons to assist it in combat. These fire demons also drop sandwiches when they die, which you can then use to deal damage to the boss. I should add that you can only hurt this boss while you are roided out. Do the aerial windmill attack to deal consistent safe damage to him. The volcano gets stunned when you attack him like this, so as long as you're flailing around like a testosterone infused magikarp, you won't be taking any damage. Number 16, Sand Volleyball. Oh, you thought I just wasn't going to include this on here? Well, think again. This boss fight lands at the number 16 spot because of how infuriating it can be. If you're playing solo, this can be a real cuck of an experience. To win this, you have to score 10 points before the enemy team does, or else you lose and have to restart. I've beaten this game over 40 times, and I'm still prone to losing this on solo. There's two hints I can give to this. The first one is to watch the shadow of the ball just before it lands. That's when you need to do your attack. After you've gotten the ball to their side, the next thing you'll need to do is cheat. Attack them as they gather around to interrupt their return. This almost guarantees a point for you. What makes this unfair is that a point counts against you for each time the ball lands on your side of the field, even if you're the one who hit it. So victory is going to require precision aerial strikes, luck, and a whole lot of cheating. Number 15, the Shitlord, aka Giant Troll Monster. I feel like I may be a bit too generous to the Shitlord for putting him this high, but I was thinking of my melee peeps out there. If you're melee specialized, you have done well in the game until you hit this boss. The Shitlord can only reliably be damaged by bow and ranged magic. In the middle of this fight, scouts will be repeatedly dropped off on top of your carriage to mess you up. All the while, the Shitlord will use his Heat Beam Eye Blast. The good news is that you can block his eye blast and he will vaporize the scouts for you in the process. Further good news is that while he takes damage, his eye blast charge will be interrupted. I try to showcase his moveset in the footage you're seeing here, but you can see how quickly I can destroy him with magic. Arrows will have a similar result, but my melee bros out there, best of luck. Number 14, the Undead Cyclops. Encountered at the end of the game, the Undead Cyclops is a much weaker version of his former self. Realistically, this boss might even be lower on the list, but I wasn't exactly sure where to put him. Because although he's part of the endgame boss gauntlet, it's hard to imagine dying on him. His attack mannerisms reflect that of your first battle with him, but with a huge difference. You can actually block just about all of his attacks, including the Coffin Slap and the Fireball Barrage. As part of his rotation, the Cyclops will jump on top of the coffin of the recently deceased, yet revitalized Groom. During this time, the Groom will quickly roam across the stage to smack you for a moderate amount of unblockable damage. You're supposed to try to avoid both him and the Cyclops, but I just like to let the Cyclops raffle stomp me into the ground because I like the abuse. Uh, I mean... I like to abuse the invincibility frames, that is. When the Groom gets done teabagging you, he'll head back to his coffin and that's when you spring out of the ground like a daisy. Rinse and repeat the process of slapping, guarding, and getting stomped on, and this boss should be over in time for you to collect your riches. Sorry, no bitches this time. Number 13, Pipistrello the Giant Bat. 
Pipistrella comes flying into the number 13 spot on our list, and once again, I have melee builds in my mind for this placement. The giant bat only has two attacks. He'll fly around chasing the player while dropping some gruesome graphic guano. Stepping in his poo will deal damage over time poison, but this attack isn't too much to worry about. His scarier attack is his vampiric lick. This attack has more range than you think it should and deals a hefty amount of damage. On insane mode, this lick one-shots you even if you have maxed out defense stats. To make this move more dangerous, throughout the fight, Pipistrella will call on increasing numbers of bats to assist him, and that's where the trouble comes in. His bat minions will latch onto your taint and immobilize you, which sets up for his vampiric lick. If you're melee spec'd, it's likely that you're close to him when this happens, which almost guarantees you're getting a good rub down. Magic and arrows work very well against him, and your biggest threat for this battle is going to be the small bats. Steer clear of them, and you should be able to dodge Pippi easily enough. Upon victory, you can claim a small version of Pippi as your animal buddy. Number 12, the Catfish. Giving it a more realistic twist on the modern Catfish, this boss is a little bit of a struggle for new players. Given that this follows the Shitlord Escape sequence, followed by the River Float sequence, you are likely to be low on health potions when you reach the Catfish boss. He is highly resistant to damage when he's in his normal state. This boss's primary form of attack is a solid punch to the dome. He will also occasionally spew out a furball that will float towards and disable the king's ship. To beat this boss, you need to simply line yourself up at the helm of the ship and destroy the furball. The catfish will come in close to give you a boxing, and all you have to do is block here. The king will send a cannonball into his mouth hole, and that's when you come in for the big damage. When the catfish regains his posture, don't attempt to muscle through him like I did. He has super armor on his attacks and will power through your own. What's annoying about this boss is that getting hit will knock you off of your platform and you'll be forced to flounder around until you can find another crocodile to commandeer. When he gets halfway down, he'll start charging around the stage. Again, align yourself at the helm of the boat and then move as he comes to get you. He'll smack into the boat and reset himself. Again, the catfish gets such decent placement because of the threat he poses to new players, since he actually requires a bit of strategy to optimize against. But once you know the method, he isn't that terrible. Number 11, the Bear Chieftain. Whirling his way into the fray, you may be surprised to find mini boss the Bear Chieftain this high up. This boss is a bit of a tough one for first timers and a decent pain in the ass on insane mode due to having so many magic happy B boys. The Bear Chieftain starts things off by dealing out a rain dance to add a bunch of wacky wavy bullshit to the foreground of the screen. He also has the Ram as his animal buddy, which will periodically charge you should you get too oppressive. Now for his actual moveset. He will do basic trash mob attacks that can all be guarded or avoided. He also gets stunned from your basic attacks as regular enemies do. The problem comes in the form of his windstorm attack that he uses as a revenge value. For this move, he will rush wildly across the battlefield dealing damage each time he runs into you. This fight has many small nuances that all culminate in a wet furry fuck fest. The key to beating this boss is to use your splash magic to interrupt his windstorm. Try not to greed when punishing him because you have the ram and the b-boys to be mindful of. Also, you'll need to pay close attention to which bear even is the chieftain, because there isn't a whole lot to distinguish between him and the others. Also, considering all the fucking rain on the screen. Defeating the chieftain rewards you with the domestication of the ram animal buddy. As a side note, you guys may have noticed that I get hit a decent amount in these fights, or that I go in with melee attacks despite being a magic main. I promise I only do this to get a wholesome showcase of each boss's capabilities and how both melee and ranged players might approach each encounter. I didn't want every boss fight to turn into something like this, because then there wouldn't be much to show. Now on to our top 10. Number 10, Medusa. A bit of a random boss, Medusa is the first to enter our top 10. Medusa can be a bit of a hassle. She spawns dozens of small volatile snakelings that detonate on contact, causing damage over time poison. Up close, she'll do a quick jab from her snake hair that has knockback. Chances are that she'll knock you into one of the snakelings for a bit of a combo. While this is going on, she'll be consistently firing poison projectiles from the snake atop her head. 
These are fairly slow moving, so as long as you're not just straight up pitching a tent, you should be able to dodge these. The hair jab has always been a bit difficult for me to time the block because there's always a small delay after she does the wind up animation that throws me off. Her most devastating attack is her petrifying gaze. This attack is unblockable, does solid damage, and will turn you into stone. While you're encased in rock, you are still susceptible to being attacked, so it's best to avoid this move entirely by being close to her when she does it. Because there are no cheap tricks or gimmicks, Death should not be too familiar with you on this boss. It's just a matter of learning her attack patterns. Defeat Medusa and be certain to pick up her weapon upon death. Number 9, The Industrial King For all of you insane mode players out there, you've probably had a nightmare or two about the Industrial Castle. That aside, the Industrial King is a pretty cool creative boss fight. He doesn't fight you himself, rather he uses a variety of tools to do the job for him. Each tool does a different type of attack, and to defeat him, you need to destroy each tool. The pylons in each corner of the arena fire off a barrage of projectiles in every which direction. Attack these as they come up to destroy them as quickly as you can. After each corner has come up and done its thing, the center pylon will raise up. After a short charge up, it will electrocute the entire arena. Be certain to jump at the proper moment to avoid damage. The most annoying attack in the Industrial King's arsenal comes from his wavy wavy hand that approaches from the left. Melee attacks are highly ineffective against it, so use magic and arrows to keep it at bay. The last tool to talk about is the elemental launcher on the right. It will cycle between poison, ice, and fire weaponry, and fire them off periodically throughout the entire battle. I almost always save this one for last because it is the most elusive of the tools. The level itself is probably harder than the boss, but try your best to focus your attacks on one segment at a time. The sooner you narrow down his arsenal, the easier this fight will be. Upon destroying his machinery, the Industrial King will retreat to the stone balcony where you can then collect the spyglass artifact. But if you want to truly win this boss fight, be certain to bust his cheeks beforehand. Number 8, The Painter. The Painter is an incredibly simple, yet challenging boss. I say that with melee builds in mind. The Painter begins his first phase by dropping down and painting a volatile creation before leaving you to deal with it. His creation self-destruct upon contact dealing a solid amount of explosion damage. I have a large investment in the defense tree at this point and you can still see just how much damage I'm taking from these things. Each time you destroy a creation, the Painter will drop down for a few seconds to create a new one. You can destroy the creations with your attacks, but they have far more HP than you would ever think necessary. Eventually I got sick of waiting around so I started suicide bombing into his explosive crayon spawns and threw myself at him until he hit his second phase. This is when you can actually do some damage. He will spawn two metric taint tons of shitty art that look like it was commissioned by Scooter Tentacles. While this is going on, he will proceed to walk around erratically about the arena while occasionally emitting a sound reminiscent of a robotic baby choking on its own saliva. Just chase him down and deliver an ass whooping and you'll be on your way to collecting more riches. Number 7, the Sock Dragon. First things first, fuck Lava World. Okay, now let's get into it. The Sock Dragon is a very difficult boss for first timers and especially for melee builds. Not to mention that on insane mode, Lava World is one of the worst levels in the entire game. That aside, the Sock Dragon has three methods of attack that are always predictable. First, he will burn the ground across the bottom of the screen. While he does this, he will also drop a boulder that starts at the right side and bounces all the way across. Combine this with the fact that he has a constantly spawning fire demon, there's a lot of things that can catch you out. I didn't get any gameplay of it here, but his third method of attack is employed if you get too close to the door. His sock puppet will plant you into the ground. I never went near the door, so I don't have footage of that attack unfortunately. To deal damage to the sock dragon, you have to hit him in the face. High magic or agility stats will benefit you the most against him, as you'll be able to post up and hit him at a distance while avoiding the dangers of his flamethrower. Be certain to dodge the recurring boulder as it bounces over you. For melee builds, your best bet is to do aerial combos for a few seconds before backing off lest you get caught in a pincer attack of his flamethrower and boulder combo. 
Sandwiches can also be used to help with your aerial melee combos, but I don't recommend wasting the item on him. This boss will take some practice to get the timing of his attacks down, but luckily he's very consistent and predictable in his patterns. The only wild card here is the Fire Demon. Number 6, the Cyclops. Probably the only boss that I feel any real empathy for. Hello Mr. Cyclops. I find the Cyclops to actually be more difficult when playing cooperatively as he has a much less predictable pattern of behavior. He only boasts two attacks but in actuality he really only just needs the one. His first attack is a quick slam he does with his daggers. This attack boasts moderate damage and as you can see here it is unblockable. After he stabs the ground a few times he will throw several knives your way which you can either dodge or block. After that, he will go right back into stabby mode again. When the Cyclops gets low on health, he will enter an enraged state that increases the speed of all of his attacks as well as his base movement speed. His damage output and patterns remain the same however. You don't really get to see it here in my gameplay footage, but that's because I rushed his final phase because it's that much of a pain in the ass. Defeat the Cyclops and he'll do a reenactment of the ending of Terminator 2 before allowing you to collect your riches and bitches. Number 5, the evil corn. Another random boss, this sentient corn has a serious problem with people. The evil corn boss is a highly defensive enemy with a generous amount of defense and health. Initially, he's not much. You run through the motions of chasing him and slapping him around. But the lower he gets on health, the more erratic and defensive he becomes. Eventually, you're playing whack-a-mole with this shithead across the entire arena, just trying so hard to get even a single hit in before he dives back underground. For melee builds, this boss is an infuriating nightmare. The evil corn doesn't deal a significant amount of damage with his attacks, but he has a decent chance of straight up outlasting you. I don't have any real advice here except to take two pills of Tolanol in preparation for the headache that you're going to inevitably have by the end of this. Number 4, The Ice King. Wowee, the fucking Ice King. Why is this boss so high up on the list? Because I dread fighting him every single time. For his first phase, you need to play a bit of a mini game. You have to run across a chasm while blocking arrows and dodging ice blasts. To avoid getting fucked on, you need to listen to what type of attack is coming your way. When you hear an arrow sound, you need to prepare to block. And when you hear the Ice King's groan, you need to jump. When you reach the end, you will get to exact revenge on the pesky archers before proceeding to your actual fight with the Ice King. He's as annoying as a hemorrhoid rash because he has the exact same mannerisms as the corn boss. The Ice King will blink all over the place taunting you and casting his ice themed magic. It's pretty simple at first, you only need to jump when the spell is cast to avoid being frozen. And even if you do get frozen, it's not a big deal as he shouldn't do much damage to you, assuming you have any points at all in defense. The attack that will most likely hurt you the most is his icicle crash. It's where he continually drops sickles on your head. There's no downtime between each tick of damage, so if you allow it to happen, you can get hit by multiple icicles in a row. The diarrhea dial gets cranked to the maximum when the Ice King gets low on health. He will continuously teleport and repeatedly cast his icicle crash. The final stretch of this boss fight is the biggest annoyance in the entire game as you keep slipping and sliding around just trying to hit this teleporting taint tickler. Defeating the Ice King showcases you with probably the most brutal death in the entire game. In addition to your usual riches and bitches. Number 3, The Evil Wizard. I've said it before, but I'll say it again, Behemoth did a great job of scaling their boss's difficulty. The evil wizard fights his way into the number 3 spot with a multi-phase boss fight. Phase 1 has you fighting 4 crystals that recklessly toss themselves at you. All you have to do is dodge them when they charge and punish them before they get up. Simple enough. As each crystal takes enough damage, they will be destroyed, so try to focus on them one at a time to cut down their numbers. After this, the evil wizard will descend from his throne to face you himself. He will dart around the arena and cast magic projectiles here and there. What you need to do is attack him with the correct move to damage him. When his shield is blue, he can only be damaged with magic attacks. 
Damage from your melee and arrows will be reflected at you, and in cooperative mode you will reflect damage on all of your party mates as well. When his shield turns red, the reverse will be true in that he can now only be damaged by melee and arrows while reflecting any magic damage back at you. Time your attacks accordingly as he shield swaps and then is on to phase 3. For his balloon form, the evil wizard will simply float around in a circle while dropping small balls of cotton that in turn release other balls of cotton. All you need to do is follow him with an aerial combo and you'll not only pop off a bundle of free damage, but also avoid the cotton balls in the process. Defeat this form and it's time to claim your riches and bitches. Or not. Enter phase 4. For me this is always the most troubling phase, especially for non-magic builds. For his spider form the evil wizard will shit out, and yes I mean literally shit out, the cultist minions from earlier. You know, the ones that are immune to magic. So while that's going on, he will constantly try to jab you with his large appendage. If you try to hit him from underneath, he will use his spooky leg scuttle to shake you off. Agility builds will have a crying time against this phase, as arrows are not an optimal weapon to hit this airborne boss, but melee can do some solid damage if you have some armor investment. You will need to perform aerial juggles while dodging his jabs. If you get knocked down, just get right back into the mix. Back off, however, when he does his leg scuttle, as this attack will zone you out. Having a high magic skill is the best way to battle the evil wizard's fourth phase. Simply rock it up and do your aerial magic attack. Each blast should do around 50 damage and will keep you airborne and out of range of both the cultists and his jab attacks. The only time you're really vulnerable is when your magic is recharging. Play defensively and once you're juiced up again, rock it back up there and blast away. Defeating the evil wizard's spider rewards you with Phase 5. It's back to Balloon Boy for Phase 5. Repeat the exact same thing that you did for Phase 3, and this boss is done for. Until you hit Phase 6. The evil wizard will stop all the strange nonsense and summon the demon sword to fight you in a fair fight. And by fair fight, I mean he's going to throw a ton of magic your way. He's an incredibly fast enemy, so he's hard to pin down to abuse. You're going to spend a good chunk of this fight just chasing the fucker down. His primary attack is a hail of fireballs that comes in bursts. While this is a fast attack that you are likely to take damage from, it is also when he's the most vulnerable. He will switch it up and do a flaming cartwheel that makes two passes across the stage. After the second pass, chase him down and punish him before he goes back to popping off more fireballs. Agility builds will have an easier time with this phase given how fast the boss moves around. Defeating this phase of the boss rewards you with the final ending of the game, no riches, but alas you will have the final bitches. Enjoy your reward. Oh, and don't forget to grab his sword after you beat him. Number 2, The Groom. And no, not the one from Outlast Whistleblower. I mean the Conehead Groom. The Groom gave me my only death in my entire playthrough on the Red Knight because I forgot he has essentially an insta-kill move. The Groom is a highly agile enemy with a relentless attack pattern. He usually opens with throwing around several bombs before executing several power attacks. You can combo lock him for a few hits, but he'll randomly get out and run back to his organ to launch the bombardment at you. Stay out of the red X's and wait for him to get finished with the symphony. Each time he gets off the keys, he will charge at you and continue his assault. His most dangerous move is his helicopter combo. While each hit does a moderate amount of damage, you'll get combo locked by it and likely die if you are anything but an armor build. On insane mode, boss damage is multiplied by 10, so yes, this attack will also one-shot you if you are full comboed by it regardless of having a max armor stat. Abuse of splash magic guarantees damage on him and will knock him away from you. This is a slow approach to beating him, but it will ensure that you're safe from his helicopter combo. On co-op mode, this boss is significantly easier because you can gangbang combo lock him, thereby preventing him from getting any attacks off at all. Outside of this, there isn't much else to talk about. Now on to our final pick. Number 1, The Necromancer. You all knew who the number one slot was going to be. To nobody's surprise, the Necromancer tops the chart on our Castle Crasher boss ranking. And the worst part is, the Necromancer himself is actually pretty simple. It's the first stage of his fight that will have you bleeding through your skin pores. On an insane mode, this room is arguably the hardest encounter in the entire game. The Necromancer starts off by spawning one of each enemy type that you've fought against thus far. 
Each enemy has also been souped up to have max agility, aggression, and magical attacks. This is an incredibly unforgiving battle and I managed to cheese it by grouping them up and hitting them with magic spam. I don't have a particular strategy otherwise except to use your splash magic at will to create space because the enemies will swarm you in no time. When it comes to the necromancer himself, he's no harder than fighting the bear chieftain. He's a light enemy that you can combo to interrupt. He does have a similar revenge value to the bear chieftain however, in that he will execute splash magic to break from you. His magic aside, he poses no real threat when you face him toe to toe. He has a generous amount of health and armor, but none of his attacks carry any red flags on them. Push your way to victory and be certain to claim his sword as your own when you're through with him. Well that brings us to the end of our video. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you don't agree with some of the picks that we have for this list, then let me know what you think in the comments below. But until then, take care, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll be seeing you soon for the next video. Bye bye